Forged from the metal to satiate the bloodlust of tabletop gaming, Warhammer was the wargaming evolution the industry desperately needed. With the depth of a story never seen before and a level of brutality that cranks it up to an 11, fans just couldn't get enough of this epic game. I'm Brittany with The Leaderboard and today we're going to revisit the iconic Warhammer franchise. Are you a diehard fan? Just wondering what all the fuss is about? We've got something for everyone as we count down the 107 facts that you should know about Warhammer. Let's get started. Fact number one, Warhammer is a miniature tabletop game that was developed by the London-based company Games Workshop in 1987. The game is set in a sci-fi dystopian future in the 41st century. While that may sound like an overused setting by today's standards, it was actually a fairly original concept back when the game was launched, especially in the world of tabletop games. Fact number two, though the company is most recognized for Warhammer, Games Workshop has been around since 1975 when three gaming enthusiasts started selling homemade wooden games from their homes. The DIY nature of their beginnings likely carried over to the premise of painting and stylizing individual battle units amongst players. Fact 3. In 1981, Games Workshop helped to found Citadel Miniatures Limited, a manufacturer of metal miniatures which would become a major aspect of their business. I mean, why sell one board that would last them a lifetime when you can make a game that keeps the customer coming back indefinitely by expanding it with new content? It's like a drug trade, except the only one getting hurt is your wallet. Fact 4. Weirdly enough, the first game published in 87 was not simply titled Warhammer 40,000, but Warhammer 40 K Rogue Trader, because, you know, why not? Fact 5, Warhammer's universe is easily defined by the game's slogan. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. Now, <laughs> I know you're currently rolling your eyes and thinking, really, I've heard that one a million and a half times before, but stick with us because they aren't kidding around. Fact 6, the gameplay of Rogue Trader was heavily oriented towards role-playing rather than strict wargaming. The nature of the rules in the early days of Warhammer were more suitable for fighting small skirmishes, which meant you could get through battles much faster. The idea began to fall by the wayside in later editions and nowadays, a comfortable chair is just as important to a game night as a reliable army as the games last much longer. Fact 7, the rules of Warhammer 40k are designed on a point system of between 500 and 2500 points. However, later editions allowed games that exceeded 3000 points. Or, to put it more simply, our need for over-the-top destruction wanted more soldiers to smash into each other so the limits were raised until we were satisfied. Fact 8, the point system is based on the size of your army as well as the skill and power of individual units. That means your opponent could have 50 figurines out while you only have a couple giant fighting machines. Fact 9. Though there are written rules, much like any game, there are many variations depending on the play group. Part of the fun of playing is near limitless scenarios you can develop for you and your friends. Another part of the fun is designing game modes that give you a huge advantage, but you don't have to tell them that. Fact 10. 3000 point games, not enough for you? At the 2009 Origins convention, there was a 95,000 point game played. Okay, I think the need for destruction is satisfied. Fact 11, just kidding, our thirst for imaginary bloodshed will never cease. In 2011, an event dubbed The Big Game had a record shattering 848,000 point match with well over 10,000 miniatures on the field. Total chaos. Fact 12, a major appeal for Warhammer comes from the creation of each unit which comes unassembled and unpainted. Players take pride in their miniatures, spending hours building and painting them to their exact liking, and then repainting them embarrassing colors as a form of punishment for losing a match. That'll teach them. Fact 13, the seventh edition of Warhammer 40k saw several major changes to the game, including a dedicated psychic phase, and general adjustments to show how psychic powers worked overall. Fact 14, while most standard units stand at roughly one inch tall, some miniatures measure up to a towering 24 inches or more. I know it's a scale thing, but at what point are these things no longer called miniature? Fact 15, are you itching to get going on your own army? A starter kit of Space Marines will run you around $125, which isn't bad of a price tag once you start looking into some of the more larger, intricate figures. Fact 16, if that seems expensive, you might not be ready to commit to a whole Space Marines chapter. The 1200 unit set, yes, I said 1200 individual miniatures, will put an $11,000 creator in your bank account. At least it would feel pretty awesome to take on your opponent with a miniature army that costs just about as much as a used Prius. Fact 17, there have been many different armies in Warhammer 40k, not all of which are represented in the current game. To drop a few names, there are the Chaos Demons, the Space Marines, the Eldar, the Harlequins, the Imperial Knights, the Inquisition, the Necrons, the Orcs, the Tau Empire, and the Tyranids, among many more. Fact 18, the history of the Warhammer universe is truly expansive and there's no way to 
to cover all in one video, but let's see if we can nail down some interesting specifics. Let's start with the Old Ones, who are not a playable race in the game, but are thought to have been the first civilized race to travel across the Milky Way galaxy. Fact 19, the Old Ones are a cold-blooded reptilian race that have deep wisdom of science, astronomy, and physics. Fact 20, despite being mysterious godlike creatures that helped shape the galaxy, the Old Ones were not actually mentioned in the earliest literature for Warhammer, but were instead brought in later. Fact 21, during their exploration, the Old Ones ended up waging war against a race of celestial beings known as the Catan, who ultimately lost, and in the aftermath went into hiding to avoid being humiliated any further, and to not be completely wiped out, I suppose. Fact 22, many, many, many years later, the Necrontier, an ancient race that had fled their homeworld due to harsh living conditions, encountered the Old Ones and asked them for their secret to internal life, but were rebuked such knowledge. Fact 23, this refusal angered the Necrontier and ultimately led them to declaring war against the Old Ones. But due to their primitive technologies, the Necrontier were unable to adapt to the Old Ones' mastery of warp travel and were slowly pushed to the outer rims of their galaxy. Considering how many civilizations the Old Ones left bitter, it's no wonder the future ends up such a war zone. Fact 24, so the Necrontier conceded to the Old Ones and returned to their homeworld where they started developing new weapons for their revenge. While developing their tech, they came into contact with the Catan, those dudes from before, and created living metal bodies for them to inhabit. From this point, the Catan and Necrontier became bros, bonding over their shared hatred of the Old Ones. Eventually, the Catan offered the Necrontiers the immortality that they have craved for so long. Becoming immortal didn't come without a price, however, and the Necrontier basically became mindless slaves to the Catan, thus marking the extinction of the Necrontier and the birth of the Necron. Fact 25, with their new slave buddies by their side, the Catan surprised the Old Ones and began what has been dubbed the War in Heaven. Fact 26, if the previous wars were anything to go by, you'd think that the Old Ones would just clean up shop again, but this time the incessant onslaught of the Catan and Necron led to the defeat of the Old Ones, which allowed for other races to flourish. Yay! This is the part where the Ewoks would be singing and dancing. Fact 27, now that the big baddies are out of the picture, we can focus on everyone else that ends up in the ceaseless war. Out of all the races in 40k, the most popular are the Eldars, while one of the least popular is the Space Wolves, which is kind of weird since Space Wolves kind of sound like an awesome progressive indie rock band. Fact 28, let's delve into the most iconic playable race of Warhammer, the Space Marines, a group of human monstrosities used as a defense for all of humanity. Armed with crazy weaponry, power armor, Armor, and so many modifications that they could be hardly considered humans, these super soldiers have proven time and time again that they're a force to be reckoned with. Fact 29, due to the extremity of space marine missions, the legions of Stardace, whom act as recruiters, often select from feral and hive worlds as their living conditions often raise individuals with natural killer instincts. Though it isn't unheard of that someone from a civilized planet is chosen as well. I bet that guy's family's oh so proud of him. Fact 30, space marine recruits must be male and between the ages of 16 and 18. The gene seed needed to create a space marine only reacts to male hormones and if a female were to take the gene seed, it would result in a painful death. Got it. Don't put your genetic material into a woman or she will die. Makes sense. Fact 31, after acceptance, recruits are put through a series of high-risk procedures that strengthen their minds and bodies via implants, biochemicals, and psychosurgery. Why do trials like these always got to be so invasive? Fact 32, the transformation into a space marine requires the addition of several extra organs, including a second heart, organs to reduce dizziness, and a mini liver to aid in healing. What you end up with is a genetically engineered human that can fight without end and probably drink you all in your college roommates under the table. Fact 33, if the procedure fails, Fails, but the recruit somehow lives, they are often riddled with health issues, becoming homicidal maniacs and gibbering idiots. Instead of wasting resources, however, these failures are sometimes put into a suicide assault squad. Some chapters of the Space Marines purposely create malfunctioning recruits by using malfunctioning implants or deformed zygots, which is only a little messed up. Fact 34, before recruits are even subject to implants, they must prove themselves through a series of trials called the Aspirants Trials. One of the most common of these trials is a duel between Aspirants to death. And you know they're not messing around when they go straight for the Mortal Kombat. Fact 35, another possible trial is called the Hunting the Hunter trial. For this test, the recruit is sent to hunt his home world's deadliest creature. So depending on your home planet, this could be a total breeze given the place is inhabited by a bunch of dweeby animals. Fact 36, the Legions of Stardust consists of a thousand marine chapters, all of which include up to 1,000 marines. That's one million of these guys. Where are they getting all those extra organs 
from. Fact 37, the Emperor of Mankind is the sovereign of the Imperium of Man and God of the human race. He has sat immobile within the golden throne of Terra for 10,000 years. Although once a living man, his shattered body can no longer support life and remains intact only by a combination of ancient technology and the sheer force of his will, itself sustained by the soul sacrifice of countless millions of psychers. So he's basically the ruler of all creation if you're a human, and he's hanging on by a thread at the cost of a lot of psychic wielders. Back 38, orcs with a K, are another recognizable race in the 40k game. They, the savage green aliens that are typically the most recognizable to players due to their similar appearance to the orcs with the C. Fact 39, the race was originally called space orcs to further distinguish them from the orcs of the Warhammer Fantasy game. But I'm not sure it's that necessary given that if you brought your space-faring gun-wielding orcs to a fantasy game, someone might complain. Fact 40, just like most orcs of fantasy, the orcs of Warhammer 40k are the oldest and most widespread enemies of the humans. This classic rivalry can be seen played out at most game nights around the US. Fact 41, orcs are relentless in their aggression. When there is no battle to be had, they will seek out native predators of whatever world they occupy, or even fight amongst themselves. Some players even call out users of orc armies as overly aggressive, which sounds like fighting words if you ask me. Fact 42, the orcs are designed to be heavy melee race with poor range. They have little armor and are pretty easy to kill. Cannon fodder, I think, is the word I'm looking for. Put them out on the table and don't get attached. Fact 43, the orcs' numbers are perfect for hoarding miniatures on the battlefield. There is even a popular strategy revolving around the orcs' sheer numbers called the Green Tide. Fact 44, orcs are the most widespread and successful race in the universe, outnumbering almost every intelligent race. This might explain why they're so expendable as a playable race. It's worth noting, however, that even though they control a significant part of known space, the territories are not united or cohesive in any way. They are kind of like the Dothraki in Game of Thrones now that I think about it. Fact 45, orcs actually reproduce from spores released from corpses in battle, making it very unlikely that they'd ever go extinct, and explains how their race became so widespread that that is disgusting. Fact 46, the orcs are a biologically engineered race that dates back 6 million standard years ago when they were created by the old ones. Seriously though, the old ones started everything. Fact 47, the old ones created the orcs to fight the Necrons during the war in heaven. I know I'm pushing the Star Wars connection here, but the orcs being so expendable kind of make them like stormtroopers, but with way better aim. Fact 48, orc tribes are considered to be any gathering of green-skinned warriors in any one location. One tribe can be even comprised of numerous clans, but what what makes them a tribe is the war boss which keeps everyone in check. Fact 49, even with the war boss, tribes cannot truly be classified as stable, as orc tribes are constantly growing, conquering other tribes, or being conquered themselves. When a tribe's leader is taken out by another tribe, his followers are usually happy to be led by someone with superior strength. Fact 50, in orc culture there are six main clans, Joffs, Blood Axes, Snake Bites, Death Skulls, Evil Sons, and Bad Moons. There are even the Freebooters, which are a group of pirates and thieves that can often be recruited if given rice to scavenging the wreckages of war. Again. Warhammer is really delivering some great sounding band names here. Fact 51, these independent factions are as likely to fight with each other as they are with any other species. Although on occasion, a particularly powerful warlord will initiate a phenomenon known as WOG, a mass unification of various tribes and warbands. Even if you dropped 11 grand on your perfect space marine army, you probably don't want to experience a WOG. Fact 52, orcs believe in two gods, Gork, the god of cunning brutality, and Mork, the god of brutal cunning. The subtle difference between Mork hits you when you're not looking, and Gork hits you when you are. Were you really expecting there to be something deeper to their religion after everything we've gone over? Fact 53, as mentioned, the Eldar are the most popular playable race in the Warhammer 40k tabletop game. They're an ancient alien race whose empire once stretched across a known galaxy, but are now on the fringe of survival due to their own actions. Their long history in the universe is what defines their play style. Fact 54, the Eldar are comparable to High Elves of Fantasy, and were actually inspired by a named after the elves of Lord of the Rings, which go by the same name. Interestingly, according to the complete Tolkien companion, Eldar translates to star people. Fact 55, Elder of Warhammer 40k is an umbrella term that encapsulates all Elder, including Craftworld Elder, the Dark Elder, the Exodites, and the Harlequin. No, not Harley Quinn, but much like her, the Harlequin's design was inspired by, well, Harlequins. Fact 56, Elder might be humanoid, but they live much longer than humans. If they avoid injury and disease, Eldar 
can live for about 1,000 standard years. Oddly, an elder's heart beats twice as fast as a human's, which according to the rate of life theory would mean they would generally have a shorter lifespan and I could just simply not be remembering high school zoology facts correctly, but they're also an alien race, so all of that can just be completely thrown out the window. Fact 57, some Eldar, despite being humanoid and most human-like of all the races actually, believe they did not evolve from mammals, but rather something much grander, going as far as saying they were created by the old ones. Basically, some of them are creationists. Got it. Fact 58, one of the Eldar's greatest attributes is their mind, which can possess information and emotion at such a rate that even the geniuses of humanity would seem dim-witted. Needless to say, their technology is on point. Fact 59, the Elder utilized various forms of psychic energy and built their technology around it. In their prime, the Elder could make entire planets solely for their pleasure and stars lived or died as they saw fit. Talk about decadence. Fact 60, it was such decadence that led to the downfall of the Elder. Their technologies and reign over the galaxy grew to a point where they did not fear anything and their need for manual labor or agriculture had diminished. It was during this time that the Elder lifestyle was dedicated to their self-indulgent pleasures. This era of sex and corruption mixed with the Elder's advanced psych led to the birth of Slanish, the chaos god of excess, whom ultimately ruptured into divinity leaving behind a warp named the Eye of Terror which obliterated all Elder within thousands of light years of it. Fact Fact 61, not all Elder in the vicinity were wiped out, however. Those who were trapped in the webway during Slanisha's destruction lived, but they slowly were losing their souls. To negate this effect, these Elder found out that by causing others agony, they became strong and vital once again. With enough of this nourishment, they became ageless and thus Dark Eldar came to be. Fact 62, the Elder got to this point of galactic dominance after a war between Necron and Catan. Having won the rebellion, the Necron were too weak to face the Elder who came in and swept the place. How opportunistic of them. Fact 63, opportunism seems to be a key factor in the Elder who also utilized and mastered the webway which was left behind by the old ones. The webway is a conduit that allows for travel at will without affecting the tides of the warp. These guys sound pretty unstoppable. I can see why they would be such a popular race to play. Fact 64, out of all the Eldar, the Harlequins are said to know the most about navigating the webway. Fact 65, the Necrons are another playable race. These robotic skeleton-like beings were, as mentioned, once the servants of the ancient Catan and had laid dormant and status tombs for over 6 million Terran years. Fact 66, being made of living metal, Necrons can reassemble themselves after being maimed or even slain. They're like the Terminators of Warhammer. Fact 67, usually Necrons hold the highest leadership across all units, but have a slow melee speed, which makes sense given they're more or less a mob of mindless metal zombies. Fact 68, as previously stated, before they were called Necrons, they were a more humanoid life form known as the Necrontier that lived in the Halo star system. They were a decrepit people with with short lifespans plagued with illness caused by high levels of radiation given off from their homeworld sun. I guess I should have known that a race with the name Necron would have a grim existence. Fact 69, Necrotier cities were built solely for their imminent demise and were more like massive tombs than cities. To them, the living were just merely visitors, as such great monuments were always built for the dead and never the living. Fact 70, the first playable Necron unit in Warhammer 40k was the Necron Raider. From there, they have established into their own legitimate army. Fact 71, the Tyranid are a lesser race and more of an intergalactic ecosystem that consists of many different organisms controlled by a hive mind. The Tyranid end goal is to only further its own survival by any means. Some would associate them with a swarm of invasive insects or zerg of starcraft. Fact 72, the Hive Fleet is a monstrous superorganism that evolved to survive in the vacuum of space. It travels between universes and consumes all organic matter in its path to ensure the survival of the Tyranid race. It's a real pain for anyone they come in contact with. Fact 73, instead of a massive terror swarm moving from planet to planet, the Tyranid Hive Fleets move in a tendril-like pattern hitting up multiple planets at a time. After consuming everything in Sight, they migrate to the surrounding planets in search of more to munch on. Hmm, kind of like my old roommate. Fact 74, the Tyranid utilize the strength and number strategy and overwhelm their opponents with their sheer animosity and numbers. Fact 75, the Tyranid hierarchy works as such. Smaller organisms are mindless and instinctual, doing routine tasks and maintenance while higher creatures can make their own decisions in conjunction with the hive mind, sort of like a more complex ant colony that could consume an entire galaxy. Fact 76, the Tyranid are not native to the Milky Way galaxy. It is believed that the Tyranid have been around for an inconceivable amount of time and after consuming their own galaxy have traveled intergalactically to feed upon others. So it is said that we are just in line in a long line of victims. Fact 77, humans have given the three armies of the Tyranid the names Behemoth, Kraken, and Leviathan. So if there was any doubt over the multitude of the Tyranid 
Standing Army, feel free to go back and listen to those names again. Fact 78, then there's Korn Damakin, which are an army of united worshippers of the blood god Korn. Their one true goal is to summon daemons of Korn through acts of bloodlust and nothing more. They literally don't care about anything except making hell a reality. Fact 79, the ranks of Damakin warbands start as mostly mortal with renegades with cultists spilling blood in the name of Korn, but with his bloodshed eventually comes Korn's demons who join the savages in battle. From time to time, a mortal may earn the opportunity of becoming a daemon prince, which grants them immortality and the unbound strength of a daemon. In fact, 80 back to a more human army, the Adeptus Raiders, or the Sisters of Battle, is an all-female army of elite devout warriors raised from infancy to protect the emperor of mankind, the ecclesiarchy, and all of its principles. Fact 81, think of the Sisters of Battle as an army of paladins that use faith and spirituality to aid them in battle. Abilities like active faith, shield of faith, righteous rage, and beacon of faith give you a good idea of the sisters' play style. Fact 82, the Tau Empire is the newest superpower in the 40k universe. They are the smallest army and control the smallest portion of the galaxy, but their unity, wisdom, and overall understanding of technology have allowed them to quickly make a name for themselves. They are young scrappers of Warhammer 40k, so to speak. Fact 83, this fledgling empire is broken up into castes, which have grown and evolved into their own variations of the Tau race. While the general Tau is humanoid with blue-gray skin and hooves, some have changed based on their caste role in the grander scheme. The Tau are born into their caste and it is illegal to breed with members of other castes. This sounds kind of Hunger Gamesy, doesn't it? Fact 84, the fire cast breeds warriors to protect the empire. The earth cast is made up of artisans and laborers to build up the empire with not only structures but food. The water cast are the traders, diplomats, and politicians, and administrators that make sure everything is running smoothly. The air cast are the pilots and crew of spaceships for good and soldiers. Lastly is the ethereal cast which make up the leaders of the united casts. Yep, straight up Hunger Games style districts. Fact 85, the Tau are meant to be ranged army and have horrible close combat skills, so careful planning is your best friend with these warriors. Fact 86, some of the most excitement within Warhammer comes from the epic heroes within each army. For instance, there's Calgar Drago, a space marine which defeated the Daemon Prince and Kar, but the last moment was dragged into the warp where the Chaos God reigned. He spent the next 100 years fighting enemies alone in this hellish landscape, which not only shows you how epic he is as a soldier, but also the potential space marines have. Fact 87, Gaskell Thraka is an orc who had a chunk of his head blown off in battle. He continued fighting while holding his brains inside his shattered skull. <laughs> Brutal. Soon after, Mad Doc Gronsnick rewired Grasnok's skull with bionics and capped it with adamantium. For whatever reason, after surgery, Grasnok began having visions of the orc gods Gork and Mork and believed he was chosen to carry out their will of uniting the orc tribes and launching the largest wog of all time. Fact 88, Sanguinus has a pretty rad story too. As an infant, he was cast astray in the warp by the powers of chaos. He was eventually found on a radioactive moon named Ba Secundus and adopted by a group of humans named the People of the Pure Blood. Because of his Primarch lineage, by the time Sanguinus was one years old, he was already larger than normal men. Because of the radiation, or perhaps the chaos, he grew giant angel-like wings which gave him the ability to fly. Eventually, he was found by the Emperor and returned to the rings in which he was intended, becoming a beloved warrior of the Imperium. Fact 89, then there's the great elder named Elrod Ulthran, who somehow managed to live over 10 thousand years. With his excessive psychic abilities, he managed to manipulate Gaskell's wog, which led them away from the Elder's craft worlds. I would sum him up as an old wizard, but that doesn't begin to describe how awesome this guy was. His foresight alone helped save Elders countless times. Fact 90, Sebastian Yark is an Imperial Guard Commissioner, made famous during the Second and Third Wars of Armageddon, which took place only because of Elder Uthren's shenanigans. Fact 91, Commissar Yark received his wounds while battling against the Orc War boss Yulgard. During the fight, Yark's right hand was severed, but that didn't stop him. He continued to battle one-handed and won by decapitating new guards. After his victory, Yark removed the orc's power claw and had it modified so he could use it as a prosthetic limb. Fact 92, it's not just the heroes that stand out though, there are also some standard units in the game that are in a world all in their own. Take for instance the Titan, which is a mechanized war machine that walks on two feet and is exponentially taller than a typical unit. Place one of these in your army and prepare for the other teams to surrender. Fact 93, Games Workshop has expanded 
expanded the Warhammer 40k universe over the years to include many more works of fiction. If you love your Space Marine army, there is seemingly no end to Warhammer novels brimming with backstory for you to absorb. Fact 94, several popular miniature game spin-offs were also created, including Space Hulk, Battlefleet, Gothic, Epic 40,000, Inquisitor, Gorka Morka, and Necromunda. Again, with these great band names, tell these guys to start a record label. Fact 95, oh wait, they did. Games Workshop at one point had their very own record label, which signed bands such as Saxon, Wrath, Rich Rags, and D-Rock. The band D-Rock was a short-lived metal band with lyrics derived straight from the lore of Warhammer. There's nothing more metal than that. Fact 96, although there were plans to create a full-fledged Warhammer 40k pen and paper role-playing game from the beginning, these did not come for many years. In 2008, a Warhammer 40k role-playing game titled Dark Heresy was published by Black Industries. So if you felt like a four-hour long tabletop battle between thousands of dollars worth of miniatures wasn't involved enough, now you can invest in month-long campaigns as well. Fact 97, going on vacation and don't have room for all your Warhammer 40k miniatures? Not a problem. A collectible card game called Dark Millennium was launched in October 2005 by Games Workshop subsidiary Sabretooth Games. Dark Millennium takes all the action of Warhammer 40k tabletop game and makes it much more portable. Fact 98, on December 13, 2010, Ultramarines, a Warhammer 40k movie was released directly to DVD. The movie is a CGI sci-fi based around the Ultramarines chapter of Space Marines. Given the vast expanse of the canon, it wouldn't be surprising to see more films like this in the future. Fact 99, of course a natural expansion of board game series is into the realm of video games, and you best believe Games Workshop has put out some 40k games. Ranging from console to PC to mobile, they're dabbled in it all. Fact 100, in 2003 there was a Warhammer 40k first person shooter that let players take on the role of a Tau soldier who is on a mission to rescue his leader and defend his race from the Imperium of Man, which is an interesting choice of perspective. Fact 101, 2006 marked the start of the Warhammer 40k Dawn of War series which took on the real time strategy genre with its flood of releases including Winter Assault, Dark Crusade, Soulstorm, Dawn of War 2, etc. Fact 102, Warhammer 40k Space Marine is a third person shooter that was released in September of 2011. The game puts players in the shoes of a space marine in the midst of war against the orcs and forces of chaos. Fact 103, overall, the game received positive reviews, scoring of 78% on game rankings and receiving a 7.5 out of 10 by IGN. Fact 104, the video games keep coming. In 2015, a turn-based strategy mobile app titled Warhammer 40k Death Watch was made by Rodeo Games and was later released on Steam. Fact 105, the opposite is happening with Warhammer 40k Regicide, which is being brought over to iOS from Steam. Fact 106, Warhammer 40k Internal Crusade is the newest entry in the Warhammer 40k game library. It's a third-person tactical squad-based shooter which is set to be released in 2016 and is currently in early access in Steam. Fact 107, in Internal Crusade players will choose a faction for the first time in a Warhammer video game. Available are the Space Marines, the Orcs, the Elder, the Chaos Space Marines, and you know it's a tough choice, but the good news is no matter who you play as, you will be surrounded by enemies wanting to kill you. What would be more Warhammer than that? Thanks for watching 107 facts that you should know about Warhammer. Which is your favorite game from the Warhammer series? Sound off in the comments, and if you like this video, be sure to check out some of our other 107 facts video by clicking the annotations or links in the description. We have new videos dropping every week, so let us know what game you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your games, subscribe to the leaderboard, where we help you game smarter.